Well, I pulled the questions out of the Q&A and a couple of out of the chat, and I put them into uh, some order here according to speaker. So I'm gonna try to uh, do that now. Um, so Colton, if I can tee you up first. Um, one of the questions was, um, uh, one of our uh, participants today uh, is curious if the model includes the cost of transporting manure to off-farm sites, both from a dollar and carbon footprint standpoint. So Colton, you need to unmute. Yeah. So um, thank you for asking that question. Um, we haven't uh, specifically uh, talked about the dollar and carbon footprint standpoint, but we are currently working with uh, the Economic Research Service to determine the variables that are needed for that type of analysis. Okay. And a second one was, what factors did you use in determining sinks uh, to sources? Um, the the uh, person asking the question says, I can see some sinks are closer to sources of different colors. Example, can a sink color red use manure from a source color blue? Yeah, so we pulled this from our modeling code and I think I'm actually gonna pass this over to Sherry to quickly uh, review a little bit of the modeling code. You guys wanna see my R code? No, I'm just that's not even that funny. Um, so anyway, there is a list of rules for what we decided to be allocated first and then allocated second, allocated third. And this was based on the lead author of that paper is Ray Bryant, who actually works in the Chesapeake Bay and works a lot on poultry um, issues. And so what that was, was, a, was an iterative allocation of surplus manure P from the county. So the dark colored counties have a surplus of manure P. Like when you look at the balance between the, the uh, manure P produced versus the cropland assimilative capacity of those counties. So each of those dark counties was designated as a source because of that balance, because more manure P than the crops could take up and remove. Um, and then the sinks around them either had a, new, a P deficit or had an overabundance of fertilizer compared to the crops, crop uptake. So the, those were the two ways that we identified sinks in that specific analysis. And the, um, the data were from IPNI, which is the International Plant Nutrient Institute. And they have this thing called the nutrient GIS. And so we took those numbers directly from there identified the sources in the sinks, found the clusters of sources, and then identified the closest counties that could assimilate the source, the full source. And the reason you see the colors kind of interspersed there is because of that rule set that is ex explained in a forthcoming paper of just like a rationale of if we had a regional scale coordination of redistribution, this is likely how it would the order of events would occur. So again, this it's hypothetical, um, tethered to a sense of reality, but that's what you're seeing there. Um, and a third question I've got listed here under Colton, but Sherry, you may need to answer it. Um, when you look at cropland, do you divide it into human and animal food crops? So you distinguish between animals, animal food and human food. Yes. Thank you. So I actually, I, I typed an answer into that one. I hope that went through. Um, yeah. Did it? Yeah. But... Oh, okay. Well, I could, I could talk about that. So basically, that's a great question. So, so far in a lot of these analyses, we're not specifying that the surplus manure nutrients goes back onto just animal crops. So there's different degrees of circularity, like I think the circular economy and circular systems is becoming certainly more of an interest in like the American society for, um, you know, ag agricultural engineers and, you know, and it's really gaining a lot of interest these days. So depending on the manure shed analysis that we do, we don't always specify that those crops would be for animals versus for humans. So depending on the different map you see there's going to be like kind of different rule sets behind that but so I had explained in there that the one that Colton showed any crop could take on the surplus manure so that would 
that was 23 different crops identified by the International Plant Institute. And they gave an aggregated assimilative capacity per sink county for all crops. But then we're working on another one where we're looking at just hay and what hay can take in. That's for like a circular manure shed in the beef industry. So talking about manure nutrients from feedlots going back to grazing lands to provide nutrients for hay. And so we do that with like specific um, coefficients you know, book values and other coefficients for nutrient uptake. You can get the extent of specific crops from the cropland data layer. So it just kind of depends on the question. Okay, um, and I think we'll jump to a question I had listed here for Gwender. Um, with regard to the political climate, and I wanna rephrase this, um, as you looked at your schematics and you have the different players involved, how, um, does legislation, legislators and politicians play into that? Have, is that? Is that part of it inherently there? Um, if so, what group is it? Yeah, so in those diagrams, um, policy is kind of represented by regulatory and action agencies. That was one of the nodes in those diagrams. Um, and I mean, obviously that's really important context because um, as I, both examples I provided for the, the local scale and regional scale um, were more top down. And so it was regulations that kind of, or it, it litigation in terms of the other one that, that led to those manure sheds um, functioning. But that's not to say that that, that is the only um, means. And in, in the Denmark example, people were collaborating before. Um, nitrate vulnerable zones kind of forced them to um, get going off the rails. But I think um, there is opportunity though with manure shed, the, the manure shed concept to really kind of cross the aisle politically. I think it's um, it's one of those issues that they, that has the potential to, to do that. So, um, but it's a it's a delicate subject sometimes, and I think um, when you think about some of the other like nodes I have listed in there, like housing and retail development, you have to think about issues of social acceptability of manure spreading, and just I'm um, thinking about when you time manure spreading to be, um, you know, so it's odor reduction for those those neighbors. Um, and I'm, I'm mentioning this because I think it connects to, to then kind of um, politicians' views of, of manure spreading and environmental justice problems. So making sure it's not uh, kind of disenfranchised communities that are, you know, potentially being next to, to areas that where manure is being spread. Okay. Or inequitably, yeah, sorry. Okay, thanks. May um, I add, can, can I jump on that just two, two pieces? Sure. So, so um, one piece is that another active field of research is actually cataloging different regulations having to do with um, manure transport over county and state lines. And Colton's, somebody working with Colton is gonna be working on that <laughs> coming up soon. So kind of getting the full landscape from that perspective. And I will say that the new <clears throat> um, head of the USDA or the new old um, Tom Bilsack is very interested in manure nutrients and, and how it relates to climate change and integrating um, stakeholder engagement in that. So we're, there's interest from him for what that's worth. Okay, uh, back to modeling. How does precipitation and storm events impact the modeling work that you've been doing? So um, Sherry, do you wanna take it or do you want me to? Um, so um, I don't know that we've done it quite yet, but we do plan to work with a group that um, models using SWOT plus and SEEP models um, to eventually look at runoffs um, and, of various fields across the United States and the manure that we might be placing on them. Okay. Legacy phosphorus. Um, the, there's a comment made uh, how will you look at that, but they also indicate 30% of the Connecticut fields are above critical levels. So how is that considered? Yeah, so we're lucky enough to have one of our team leads is 
very, um, it was an early uh, scholar on legacy phosphorus. So that's Pete Kleiman. So this is like something that's very always on the tip of our tongues and kind of trying to deal with how, what that means and, you know, what, what, what croplands can really truly assimilate. And from a data perspective, one of our colleagues in Georgia, Dinku Indale is working to get um, different types of data to make sure that when we say that it's a simulative capacity, like it, it really is a simulative capacity, those types of data are hard to come by as well. I will say for kind of the ambition that we have for you know reconnecting these systems and looking at optimized manure sheds, there's a lot of different types of data and sometimes they don't talk to each other that well and sometimes they don't exist at all. So um, that one, if anybody has ideas, for that one. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there with a comment. You know, it's it's uh, common in the nutrient management planning world to uh, expect that as we apply manure at a, a nitrogen-based balance rate to the cropland, that phosphorus will be applied in excess and that we will see those soils, as mentioned, 30% uh, growing. And that's why nutrient management planning is so important so that the producer can understand and adhere to their planning and sometimes it's okay if the soils are above a critical levels if there's something like a phosphorus indexing tool utilized uh, to assure that that phosphorus is staying in place in that uh, soil. But nutrient management planning is an important component. And even though the manure shed itself may look a little bit out of balance, there are still tools within the manure shed that the states and agencies uh, you know, endorse and we utilize as a producer to assure that we're still doing the right things. Okay, in terms of modeling, are you considering hyd hydrology or hydrogeology and surface and groundwater vulnerability? Yeah, I think that kind of goes back to uh, the previous answer I give. If Sherry wants to um, elaborate, she can, but we again are working with um, Jeff and Mike um, within the USDA ARS. Um, uh, that are that are heading the SWAT and SEEP models. Okay. Well, and there, there, is also, there was a question about the Chesapeake Bay. So we already, there's already some great models in there by Dr. Raj Sibin, who, um, who is working specifically with hydrology stuff. So <clears throat> we're getting some of that, they're getting some of that really clear for that system and then hoping to expand nationwide with SWAT. Okay, um, I think one last question, a number of these other ones kind of tie back into a number of ones that we've already addressed, but um, with your respective manure management plans in the manure sheds, um, do they have any authority or regulations and enforcement to prevent over application manure or do your participants respect the NMP nutrients as resources rather than something required for requiring disposal? It's kind of a long uh yeah, I, I can jump on that. Um, so all states right, have an application planning, manure planning, nutrient management planning law, and those things have to be adhered to. I think that the bar is always raising for the producers. We see that in the, the bar is raising, not in the, in the perspective of laws or regulations, although some of them would feel that way. I think most states, if we've kind of leveled off and, and everybody understands what, what the floor is of compliance, and the producer compliance is where the bar is raising. I see more and more producers compliant because they have better understanding and the education that we've given them uh, over time and their actions of doing the right thing allows them to understand that the manure nutrient is a resource and not a waste disposal. So in my, in my career, I've seen that shift in the approach change. We always have that nitrogen and phosphorus imbalance that I mentioned coming into play with, with nutrient management planning. And I think more and more producers are understanding that we see them utilizing more and more tools to place a nutrient and hold that nutrient where they place it uh, at the time and not allow it escape and utilize it for a crop. So I don't know if anybody else wants to jump in there, feel free. I, I would just say that that's part of that vision, that kind of pie in the sky vision of that coordination that would need to be done, you know, across multiple parties, like across producers and you know, animal producers, crop producers, policymakers, consumers, even to incentivize this stuff. So that's, you know, that kind of coordination is, is, is really what we're going for. And that's, you know, takes a lot of partnership. 